Last week, we learned about biomes, what they were, uh, and what the six major biomes of the Earth were. This week, we're going to learn about the same thing, but thinking about it a different way. Um, the six major biomes of the Earth, which were freshwater, marine, desert, grassland, forest, and tundra, uh, were all designated or defined by the types of plants and animals that live in a particular area. Um, to a large extent, the types of plants and animals in an area <coughs> is moderated by both the temperature of the area and by the amount of rainfall that occurs in the area. Okay, those are the limiting factors that affect what lives where. This week we're going to learn about a different way of, of thinking about uh, the planet, the, the biosphere, um, and thinking about what lives where and why. And we're going to be learning about something called anthropogenic biome, or an anthro, anthrome. <clears throat> anthropogenic means human-centered or human-focused. So it's thinking about the biomes or the way life is organized through the lens of what human uh, effects or settlements are where. Where we are and what we do as a people uh, greatly affect what's living in a given place, right? Here in my yard, okay, my neighbor's yard over there, beautiful lawn, uh, and that's a pretty common sight here in a city. But of course, my family has made choices about turning this into a growing area for plants, or for foods, and that affects what visits here. Okay, and that's on a very small scale what we're going to be talking about. So let's think about um, how to think about the biomes originally, and then we'll eventually get back to the anthropogenic biomes. So for example, both deserts, both deserts and tundras are defined as areas that have a very small amount of precipitation uh, each year. It doesn't rain very much. The main difference between these two biomes is that deserts are generally hot and dry um, with uh, extreme fluctuations of temperature over day and night, while tundras are often very cold over the whole year, and they have wet soil, um, even though there is not much precipitation because it's so cold, evaporation doesn't happen very much, and then it freezes. So to see an, an example of kind of this complicated interaction of what bio biome is where, let's look at the Carcross Desert. So here is our map of North America. Let's zoom out a little bit more. Where this red dot is is the Carcross Desert. Um, you can see most of North America. We talked about how the northern bands are forests, the east is forest, the center is grassland, the west are kind of deserty areas turning into a strip of green along the coast. Now up here in the in Canada, this area is generally pine forests, very cold pine forests. So the fact that there is a desert in this region seems very strange. We're going to zoom in, okay, and when we get really tight in there, you can see that it's sand. It looks like the Sahara. It looks like a desert. The Carcross Desert is way smaller than the city of Washington, D.C. So this is a very tiny area, okay, but why is it so deserty in this particular spot? Let's take a look. Our first stop is in Canada's Yukon Territory, right next to Alaska. The Yukon is full of evergreen forests and rivers fed by melting snow and glaciers. It's mostly green, cold, and full of water. But it also happens to be home to a dry, sandy patch of land called the Carcross Desert. The whole thing covers less than three square kilometers, which is why it's sometimes referred to as the smallest desert in the world. Like, you could walk across it in less than 20 minutes. And right on the other side, you'll find more mountains lakes and evergreen trees just like the rest of southwestern Yukon. But as random as the Carcross Desert seems, it is no accident. It's the product of thousands of years of geological evolution. During the last ice age, the whole region was covered by glaciers, sometimes over a kilometer deep. And as they retreated, the glaciers gouged the landscape and filled valleys with meltwater, turning them into lakes. Like the spot where the Carcross Desert is now used to be under 120 meters of water. But over time, 
the water levels dropped and those lakes shrank. Now, each spring, when the water from nearby lakes is low, wind from the mountains picks up exposed sand and dumps it on Carcross Desert, constantly replenishing its supply. But the catch about the so-called smallest desert in the world is that it is not technically a desert. Typically, for something to be considered a desert, it has to get less than 250 millimeters of rain a year. Now, Carcross is a fairly dry place because it sits in the so-called rain shadow of nearby mountains, meaning that when clouds full of water roll in from the Pacific, they run into the mountains and dump most of their rain before they get to Carcross. The Carcross Desert still gets about 280 millimeters a year, so scientifically it is considered a dune system rather than a desert. That might seem like a technicality, but the truth is, Carcross Desert is really not that desert-like. One main giveaway being that its plants and animals don't have much in common with true desert species. But while these pieces make it clear that Carcross is not a desert, they also tell us something else about Carcross. See, they have a lot in common with another ecosystem, in Mongolia. That's because they evolved back before the Bering Strait separated Asia and North America. Back then, Yukon had a dry climate much closer to one in parts of Mongolia and Russia today. And Carcross Desert ties this patch of the Yukon to its distant geological past. So while it might not be the smallest desert, it is still a very special place. A few thousand so now, another way to think about biomes that more and more people are beginning to use has to, again, do with us, with humans. We are currently living in what is known as the anthropogenic age, the age of humans. As a species, humanity lives on all seven continents of our planet. We have visited our moon and are making plans to build a base there for further exploration, um, including sending people to Mars with the hopes the long-term plan of colonizing the red planet. Our choices affect every other living thing on this planet, and so people are beginning to think about biomes through that lens. How do we, humans, affect the biome? So we have named it the anthropogenic biomes. It's a little bit different than the, the biomes because it has to do with human effects. This scale ranges from most wild or natural on one end to urban or densest settlements on the other end. Um, all of the bio biomes we learned about last week would be considered uh, wildest or the most natural on this scale. Um, so the anthromes on this scale are wildlands, forested, rangelands, croplands, villages, dense settlements. Wildlands are places that are least changed by humans. Um, we are doing more and more to both preserve and to protect, protect these lands because they are untouched and are becoming rarer and rarer each year. Um, often these type of places have plants and animals living on them that ha have the potential to have maybe um, positive uses in medication or pain mitigation or other um, natural derivatives that we could use. Like we are discovering that there are some bacteria that exists in far flung parts of the world that we can use to clean up some say oil spills or other um, polluting things that we do. And if those areas go away and those things go away, we won't have access to those types of organisms that evolution has developed over billions of years.
forested areas are dominated by tree cover and often have um, a lot of precipitation. There are relatively few humans living in these areas. The taiga that rings northern Canada and Eurasia, an example of a forested area, as well as the Amazonian rainforest. People live in those areas, but it's very few and very far between. Rangelands are fairly empty of humans, um, but there are often many grazing animals that are being raised by humans that live there. Um, rangelands, lands that, hum that animals can range or uh, explore or wander on. These lands are often kept pretty close to grasslands, which is where they uh, kind of evolved from. Um, because they are used mostly by grazing animals, which were adapted to living grasslands. Croplands. Croplands are some of the more, where we begin to see the mo more human impact developing. Croplands are lands that humans alter significantly in order to grow the foods that we need in our urban or most densely populated areas. So we grow the food in croplands, they get shipped to the urban areas. Um, and we make other products in, in croplands as well. Basically, they are lands that are changed to grow the things we need in our cities. Um, but because of that, there's often less biodiversity on these lands. You only have the crops or the plants and animals that can coexist with those crops. Um, humans also affect the amounts of water available in our croplands, either by, say, damming rivers or irrigating and diverting water from other places. So that has a huge effect on not just the croplands, but the land where the water that we use in the croplands comes from.
villages are rural human settlements that are dependent on agriculture or growing food for survival. Um, it took me a little bit to understand what the difference between a cropland and a village is. Basically, villages are more self-contained. When a village grows its food, the village uses that food. Whereas on cropland, the food that's grown in the cropland is shipped to a city where there's lots of people but not room. brings us to the dense or urban dense settlements or urban er areas highly developed the high population density meaning lots of people living fairly close together I mean we have a urban areas have high carbon and nitrogen emissions which again has an effect on everything else on planet Earth um, one of the interesting things is these uh, these lands often have more living area an actual area of land right if I have this much area to grow things in I can actually fit more people than I could squeeze in there because if we go like this because cities dense urban areas grow up think skyscrapers apartment buildings things like that and those are the major divisions of anthropes okay? of course like with biomes you can get more um, more specific and you can break them into uh, different types of villages, different types of cities. Some people talk about like dense, really dense urban cities like Manhattan or um, Shanghai or Hong Kong versus like the suburbs. Here if you go out to Silver Springs, Bethesda, um, even out into PG County, that's all still considered um, urban because the amount of people living in the area is pretty dense. Even though compared to downtown, there's a lot more greenery once you go out into our suburbs. But the suburbs are still considered urban settlement from an anthrone perspective.
people will also sometimes think about the indoor environment, right? The indoor anthro. <clears throat> a lot of our things that have happened this year where we've had to stay at home and away from other people was because of the way that coronavirus um, was very good at using indoor spaces to spread, right? We're learning more that outdoor spaces are safer, indoor spaces are more what we've had to manage, and that is why thinking about, that's one of the reasons, an example of why thinking about human effects on the land is such an important part of our reality. The things we do affect everything else. Let's review the anthrome. And remember, an anthrome is much like a biome. It's describing a type of land, but through a human-centric view. How have humans affected this particular land, and how does that change what lives there? The most natural are wildlands. Uh, these are places that are least changed by humans. Um, they generally have a pretty great diversity of plants and animals um, because those plants and animals that evolved to live in them are still around. Um, and we're doing more and more to protect them, both because uh, of, say, their natural beauty. Uh, the biodiversity is also important, both for the ecosystem health and there are potential um, products that we could develop from naturally evolved organisms. Forested areas. These are areas that are dominated by tree cover. Um, there are very few humans living in these areas. There are some, but they are generally uh, relatively wild. Um, sometimes they are left to grow and then they are cut down and harvested as products. Sometimes they're just so remote uh, that people don't have easy ways to use them. Um, the taiga that rings northern Canada and Eurasia is one example of forested lands. <coughs> rangelands. Rangelands are also fairly empty of humans, um, but there are often large numbers of grazing animals that are being raised by humans, um, often for food, sometimes for other products, but they are grown for humans by humans. They generally have a great diversity of plants and animals because the natural animals are often there, um, as well as the ones that humans bring in to live, there, live on them. Um, they are pretty close to naturally occurring grasslands, just with some human changes such as fences across um, areas which sometimes keep animals from migrating, things like that. But they're pretty close to the natural grasslands that would exist there otherwise. Croplands. These are lands that humans alter significantly in order to grow the food that we need to survive in our urban areas. Um, this is where we grow crops, both for food and for, say, sisal to grow twine and rope, um, or other things, various um, dyes or foodstuffs that we use to make medicine. Any place that is uh, turned into a place that humans grow food. Um, because we grow food in these lands and we adjust them so significantly, the biodiversity is often fairly low on these lands. Villages. Villages are rural human settlements that are dependent on agriculture for survival. These are small groups of humans um, that change and adapt the land, but they basically grow the food that they use to eat and survive. Okay, they grow food for local use. And then we have dense human settlements. These are highly developed environments um, have a high population density. They typically have high carbon and nitrogen emissions. Um, often, they have more, more living area than actual area of land. Meaning, if you have, say, 10 square miles of land, you might have 20 square miles of living space because you have multiple floors of apartment buildings. 
very highly changed from the natural environment. And then the final one that sometimes people think about is just indoors as a general concept. Um, this is not a particularly natural, quote unquote, environment because the indoors are often kept separate from the outdoors, i.e. you might have air conditioning or heating that heat up or cool off your insides, but that doesn't allow for an exchange of air with the outside. And so organisms that can survive indoors are just adapted to the local conditions. And this is a fairly new problem because having lots and lots of indoors, especially these large, you know, multi-floor buildings is a fairly new development. It's only been in the last hundred or so years that we've really been able to build these gigantic structures that uh, are just separate from the outside world. We're still learning what this all means. Again, as we've all gone through this past year, indoor spaces uh, were a great place for coronavirus to thrive and spread. And so learning how to manage those indoor spaces for things like coronavirus is becoming more and more important for our lives as we have learned. These are the anthromes, okay, the human defined <coughs> um, ecological units on planet Earth.